taxes make us look good get rid of all of this and I'm gonna just I'm just gonna feed us across into storage Hello and welcome to the last Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from three fantastic countries in Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. And Audrey. Hi, everyone. And as of today by Alessio. Hello. And Audrey. Hi, everyone. And as always, I still remain your host, Fen. Hi. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about four games and a topic that I personally have been wrestling with as I try and sort out my gaming attic miniatures. But before we get into all of the topics, uh, it's time for the the good old classic Last D catch-up. And uh, how have things been with you, Alessio? Oh, I met with my gaming group finally after two years of COVID. So pretty great, actually. We played a lot. We played a lot of game in my shelf of shame to an all-time low of 13 games, which is kind of good because some games are actually quite new, so I have to test them, right? So I, I have been busy the right way, of course. These are hard times indeed, so this is very welcome. And what about you, Audrey? going to say not much but actually uh, a fair amount of stuff has happened in the last uh, times with my husband we went on our uh, honeymoon a bit late after the wedding but we don't care so we went to europe Park in strasbourg france uh, which is very small compared to the, 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 the let's say the immensity of the website but we managed to snag a copy of spirit island from the shelves Ooh. <laughs> and we had uh, we had a few plays on uh, uh, so yeah we we, tr- we did the, the level zero um, difficulty uh, game we tried one of the uh, invaders and we didn't find the game that hard but because we were at low difficulty a bit complex yeah but uh, I didn't feel that it was as hard as that it was as hard as, hard as uh, sounded like from the uh, let's say uh, public and stuff but i'm pretty sure we will have a topic on that at some point and i will get to share uh, more on that then <laughs> you can make it as hard as you want yeah it's yeah. very slideable on the difficulty it's as hard as you want yeah it's yeah. very slideable on the difficulty which is great yeah yeah that, that's how it seemed and uh, let's say bottom zero uh difficulty level is really let's say uh, Doable. Not affordable, but yeah, do- doable, and yeah, the the basic spirits are easy to introduce. Spirits are easy to introduce beginners. Uh, great, great experience overall. Um, and another thing, uh, which is that last week I received my expansions uh, and stretch goals for the tinted grey Kickstarter in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I was excited because of which I didn't want and then i opened the second box and then i saw la morta roja so, huh? <laughs> la, <laughs> la muerte roja yeah i was expecting la mort rouge but no oh, oh. <laughs> and so everything is being sorted out by ukraine i sent them the mail uh, on thursday and on the next monday i got a new tracking number in fact if you go to bgg geek market right now and you want to buy the horned rat expansion for cows in the old in the old world the most the, the cheapest version the most the, the cheapest version you can get is the spanish one la rata cornuda <laughs> the more uh, you it know. depends on countries and uh... <laughs> so yeah that's uh, that's it for me. So a very good news and let's say a number or a space taking news. Good news and let's say a number or a space taking news. <laughs> and what about you, Fen? What have you been up to lately? Well, it's it's springtime, so that means a lot of yard work and other things. But 
on top of that, uh, I've been sorting out the gaming, the gaming attic, which is, I would say, from certain angles it looks finished, um, and then from other angles it looks like a dump site because I've got to get the working <laughs> section of it sorted, and I've got all, I've run out of a budget to get more storage to get everything Lovely. properly fixed, which is like it's such a big expense storage for board games. You think. shared the pretty pictures aside, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to share some more pretty pictures, but not with our listeners, because what I've actually been spending time, and even the two hours before we started recording this, I was doing more work on it, is I've been getting our guest house ready, because uh, mm. we're finally, after COVID time, getting, like, I have not had a single visitor from the UK to the island. The last people who visited me were my parents who visited me when we were living still in Stockholm. So... This is the first. So I've been sorting out uh, our um, guest house. And here we go. This is the guest house in full. Here we go. This is the guest house in full. It's a single oh. floor. Uh, it's, it's like it's one floor, but our house is basically one floor and an attic as well. Swedish style. Um, we've. I was just fixing the roller blinds a couple of days ago because they were installed not quite right. So I had to reset them, but that was pretty simple. Old, not quite right, so I had to reset them, but that was pretty simple. And the one room we've basically finished, you can see one of the paintings I was starting to hang, is a hedgehog, um, is is the living room. with a, As you can see, you've got, like, you can open the doors and sit out on the decking outside and have your breakfast in the sun. Okay, but that's so lov the, lovely. This is picture aid for listeners. When Fen says guest house, it means literally a house. Yeah, it's it's got two bedrooms, um, which one's going to be a double bedroom, the other is like two singles, uh, so, you know, families and everything, and then has all the fridge, freezer, everything you'd expect. A, a small Fish cabin, pods? yeah. Yes, a small cabin, that's fair, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, this prompts a very important question. When can we come? Well, I've got to get it ready and everything. And then it's a matter of working out because we're going to be renting it to people. Doubles in population, as I've mentioned before. So places to rent are very valuable and at a premium. But I personally think it's nicer to come to this island in spring when all the poppies bloom and the flowers are just starting to bloom now. Uh, or in autumn, where the leaves start turning. And, uh, or in autumn, where the leaves start turning. And the weather is more... For me, at least, it's more like Britain, w without the rain. Because Britain's... just rains. I don't oh, miss that. Oh, okay, yeah. let, me, let me put it this way. It's 24 degrees out, uh, out here. It's 24 degrees out, uh, out here right now. Uh, what is the temperature there now? Oh, that's a good question. I shall just... Uh, it is a cloudy 11 degrees with no wind. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe next month. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> thing is, it is that bizarrely, this is actually a week where it's going to rain, which is unusual. <laughs> uh, but um, I think May is like a really good time. My friends are coming at the start of June, so they're going to catch the very start of the summer. But that's oh. going to feel like a British summer to them, because... I don't know if you've ever seen it, but in Britain, it's like, oh, it's 11 degrees outside, time for shorts and flip-flops, and it's above 10 degrees, oh boy, it's time to hit the beach. So, <laughs> yeah, I've been doing, like, electrics, and I've been, um, like, sorting out bits and pieces and hanging pictures, um, and the dog's been really helpful, because she, for some reason, loves DIY. So, <laughs> on the board game front, uh, Nemesis Kickstarter arrived recently. I'm now in a slightly different situation to Audrey in that I have a s double sets of certain things because it was just less hassle and cheaper for me to pick up. Uh, I ended up opening up the core box because it turns out they updated the miniatures for the characters in the core box. And I was like, turns out they updated the miniatures for the characters in the core box. And I was like, I, I don't like the little original ones. They're not great to paint. So I'm going to I guess I'll live with opening two boxes and work out what to do with that spare copy of Nemesis I half-painted. Yeah. Uh, but I also have Cardamorphs and Void Seeders, which I'm probably going to put on the board game Cardamorphs and Void Seeders, which I'm probably going to put on the board game Geek Marketplace. Tricky thing here is uh, shipping off the island it, to, across Europe. It, it's never cheap. I don't have access to mm. the cheapest delivery sources, so I don't know what's going to happen with them. Um, 
But I will say, just very quickly, if you like Nemesis, Card Warp and Void Seeders is just good solo, good co-op, good semi-co-op. So yeah, that's a brief review of those two expansions. Carnivores is really rough if you play semi co op because it's so combat heavy that the poor soldier and anyone else who's like the scout, anyone who's got combat capability, spends all their time holding the line and they. But yeah, that's. Yeah, that, that one time we played Carnivores on semi co op, everyone died. Yeah, yeah, it is <laughs> really rough. If, if you've got like the scientist and the um, engineer who are terrible in combat. Uh, then, then you're like, well, we need help, and they're like, no, no, no I got to get on with my, got to fix the engines, yeah. So. Hmm. Okay. But uh, the other part is my little first segment, which is I'm going to talk, hopefully, as quickly as possible, about two games. One because it's a simple game, and the second one because I can't talk it's about it because simple... it's a simple game, and the second one because. I can't talk about it for very game. long without getting into spoilers. So, yeah, the first one is Tussie Mussy, designed by Elizabeth Hargrave, Wingspan, and printed by Buttonshy. So, if you don't know the Buttonshy shtick, they do games. So, if you don't know the Buttonshy shtick, they do games that in a little plastic wallet that you can keep in your pocket, simple little card games, usually 18 cards. Uh, Tussie Mussy is a tradition, a Victorian tradition, of making a bouquet of flowers. So, effectively, very straightforward game for two to four players. You'll shuffle up a little deck of cards, and then on your turn you draw two of them, you look at them, and then you offer them to the player to your left. There goes the dog. What? Hi, Pam! Yeah. Pamsha! <laughs> I don't know. I've been teaching her to speak lately, and she's become so much more vocal. I've really seen somebody walking past the house. Uh, yeah, so you look at the two cards and you offer them to the player to your left, but you offer them one face up and one face down. And they have to decide if they want the face up card or the face down card. If they take the face up, it goes into their bouquet. If they take the face down, it goes into what's called their keepsake. And they don't turn it on, but that's it. And then it's... Mm, go on. No, I, I love that draft. It's the same as a, a It's a Wonderful Kingdom. I guess yeah. I think yeah, it's great. It's a good it's a good draft mechanic. It keeps like it's great for two players. It's better with even with more because it's so simple that you can kind of have a conversation around while still doing more because it's so simple that you can kind of have a conversation around while still doing this because you're just making simple decisions, but they can really get quite hard. Uh so then it's their turn and they do the same and you just go round and round until everybody's drafted four cards. And then you will separate the two rows, the face down and the face up. Then you will separate the two rows, the face down and the face up, turn all your cards up and score them. And the cards may have hearts on them at worth points or they might say for each red flower, including this one, score a point or for uh, if it's each different colour, score points and you record your score, you score points and you record your score you discard everything you go to the next round and you pass to the right same thing and then you do it a third time to the left highest score over the three rounds wins really easy to get into and actually has nice fun tricky decisions um i got the kickstarter edition decisions um i got the kickstarter edition so i got all the expansions because they weren't very expensive i'll give a very brief review of those uh, the orange expansion gives you orange flowers, just more cards. It's fine. The green expansion gives you greenery. Greenery's really cool. There's four cards. You want one greenery, it's two points. But if you get more than one greenery, each one's worth minus one point. So there's this really fun moment where somebody like, when somebody's got a piece of greenery face up and you know they've got greenery, every single face down card they take is like a landmine for them. They're like, I don't really want this face up card. It's not great. It's just immense fun to, to go through all of that. And then there's, of course, you start joining the greenery club when you get your own piece and then you have to go through the whole thing. So I really like the greenery expansion. I think it's great. That's that, that's smart. It is. It is. It's fun to be like, oh yes, I've got one, and then oh no, I got one early. Oh god, <laughs> the number of ribbons, and they basically give extra points to certain conditions. Like uh, the green ribbon is each player scores plus two points for each of their greenery cards. So just change the greeneries again. Um, I like the greeneries. Or 
the other ones are like players with the most hearts scores three points or the fewest hearts and so on so it mixes things up even further i don't think it's as imp there's a solo nice. expansion it's good it's got an expansion itself which makes it even better i'm not going to the details of the solo expansion i'm just going to say i've played it solo a lot it's always challenging and it's very easy to operate which is nice to have a solo game that's just boom 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 job done so that's Tussy Mussy, is they don't have an EU distributor. I had to pay customs on this, which I wasn't expecting, because previously they had a distributor that got stuff into the EU with no problem. They've got a UK distributor now, but that doesn't fix the problem. So they are aware of this. They are trying to solve it. They're looking for it to solve it. They're looking for a solution. I passed on their latest Kickstarter because they didn't have an EU distrib distributor because I nearly paid as much in customs as I did for the game, which was, like, not fun. But, but mechanically, bit two thumbs up, and I think that Button Shy are a... a but mechanically, bit two thumbs up, and I think that Button Shy are a, a great company, um, although maybe they need to stop making plastic wallets. I'm not sure what you'd make them out of, but, you know, plastic... Okay, second one. Adventures of Robin Hood from Cosmos Games. Adventures of Robin Hood from Cosmos Games. Uh, this has yeah. been in German for a while. Um, it is a two to four player adventure game. Stealth adventure game. You can play it solo, as long as you're fine controlling more than one character at the same time. Uh, I will say, first of all, real rules. Um, and... Uh, Basically, you have a really... There's three really interesting mechanics that make this stand out from other storybook games. The first one is you have a double-layered board. So when you put the board out, it shows Nottingham, uh, Nottingham cards like punched-out areas that you can pull the cardboard out and flip it over. And it has something printed on the back and it has something printed on the bottom. So you always have, over every story you play in the campaign, the same like main map it's the same place it feels like going back to Sherwood but things change but things change and they've done some really neat stuff with this like they can represent coaches moving across uh, or places having guards or not having guards changes in development along the story and even like if you've made certain decisions they can change things up which is it's really cool downside it's really cool downside one downside, and then go ahead. Uh, I keep wrecking the tokens whenever I try and take them out. I ended up having to get a like a butter knife to lever them out in order to stop damaging them because they're so secure. Yeah, I, I, actually, that, that's uh, the mechanic is pretty. Yeah, I, I, actually, that, that's uh, the mechanic is pretty cool. Uh, it, someone called it Advent Calendar, the board game, because yep. it feels like that. It, it's pretty cool, and uh, I have to say. Stuff persist, some stuff persists through sh scenarios, and that's pretty, pretty incredibly cool. Some stuff persists through sh scenarios, and that's pretty, pretty incredibly cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Advent Calendar, the game, is a great way to pitch it to people, or yeah. sneak, sneaking around on an Advent Calendar, which brings me to the second mechanic, and that's moving. Yeah. The move, I love the moving, I really want to see this moving. Yeah. The move, I love the moving, I really want to see this in other games. Each player, Robin Hood, Maid Marian, Little John and Will Scarlet, um, gets five figures. Two of them are, represent your character standing. Two of them represent your character walking and have like a little trail behind them. like physical. And when it's your turn to do stuff, you uh, take these trails, the long ones, um, with, a, with a little bit of wood out the back, it's very hard to explain without visually showing them but they're very distinctive and you build a little like line connecting each one and then put your others and then you remove all the previous stuff so it allows you to like move in discrete amounts and you're trying to move from pieces of shade to shade because if you're caught in the, a clearing when a guard activates which you never know quite when it's going to happen then you could get captured and that sucks so it's got that whole feeling of dashing piece, the running piece. You're rewarded by being allowed to put a white cube into the bag. And that's the last mechanic I think is really cool. Is you have one bag, it holds discs, 
coloured discs, and you reach in and draw a disc out, uh, and that tells you whether it's a given player's turn, or if it's, hey, choose who's going to have forces of Nottingham. So, semi randomizes it, but once something's drawn out, it stays out until everything's been drawn. So you, you get an idea of who's left to act, and do we have the flexible action... Uh, are the guards going to have a go, or can I risk standing in the middle of this clearing right now? Which adds to the stealth mechanic really well. And that's where you get, like, if you don't use the long piece, you get to put white cubes into the bag, which represents you saving your strength, and you can easily pass a check, or more easily pass a check. Like, say, if you get caught, you're going to need to punch up the guards. I'm making punching actions right now, I don't know why. Um, and, uh, and so you can move more conservative... Uh, and so you can move more conservatively to help pass things if they go wrong or if you think there's stuff you're going to have to do in the future. Beyond that, I can't really talk too much about where the game goes because it just spoils a, a nicely written story and a fun experience. It just spoils a, a nicely written story and a fun experience. There's a whole load of other bits and pieces. Guy of Gisborne gets his own little figures. Um... And and, uh, and and more other things occur. Uh, I will say the first chapter is a introductory story, kind of very much on rails. And there was a moment where, like, we couldn't figure out what we were supposed to be doing because the game story didn't tell us properly. Um, and it, it, so it resulted in a lot of wasted time. We did succeed. In the end, we figured it out. And it did take a little bit of a logical leap. It would be nice if the game had pay attention to things because you never know what's going to be useful or what's not. Um, but once I got past that, it was sweet. Yeah, uh, something to add to that uh, in a non-spoilery way. I, I, I think we can safely say that this game... So always try to fill your player count because it's uh, seven scenarios and when you're done, you're done. Uh, try to play it with full people because it's fun it's a lot of fun it requires coordination there are stuff which you can do in a team uh, it uh, requires coordination there are stuff which you can do in a team uh, it's uh, it's very very cool it is it, it is yeah you're definitely right it's a one and one and done or one and put it on the shelf for several years before going back to it uh, I'll also add, I think it's better with a more casual crowd. It's a nice little... Uh, I'll also add, I think it's better with a more casual crowd. It's a nice little game to introduce people to the idea of storybook games and campaign games without overwhelming them because the mechanics are really simple to get to grips with and you can handle a lot of the stuff and they can just get to grips with this is how I move, this is how I draw from the back to do. So. Yeah. Also, uh, I, I have to say that it reminds a, a bit pandemic because you are on a timer most of the time mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is a, a kind of an intensification phase at, uh, w when the enemy acts. So uh, it reminds of pandemic but core mechanic in a very cool way. It actually uh, never happened with the pandemic spin-off. So... Uh, even for people who just uh, like logical puzzles, uh, this is worth it because it's simple, it's clear, and it's... Oh, well, clear, uh, it is not the clear, actually, but uh, it's a fun game, it's uh, fun to play, and it's simple to play, so that, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I would recommend this for anyone who's looking for a board game to play with young teen children. Uh, or those uh, like advanced children who are around like 10 ish um or those uh, like advanced children who are around like 10 ish um and people who are just they, they, they love robin hood i mean it is the only english folklore that's really <laughs> endured it's a good story um oh, yeah, des bois. this is a really good oh, telling bit <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good oh, telling bit <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the painted man. Because I mean, if if you translated Robin Hood in French, Robin Robin à la capuche, uh, yeah, Robin des Bois is much better. <laughs> Shorter. Robin especially. of Huxley. Yeah. Um, well, um, well, that's that's it. So now we're going to get on to our first topic, which is is um, I believe it's all. Uh, I've lost track. Whose is it? Dice realms. 
Yes, it's yours. I thought so. Uh, so that brings us on to our first topic, which uh, Robin Hood doesn't have. First topic, which uh, Robin Hood doesn't have any, but many games do. A whole bunch of miniatures. And Audrey, let's talk about miniature storage. Yes, because uh, when we start when we start to get into the miniature hobby, we start to have miniatures. We have sometimes games with inserts. We have sometimes wargaming, which don't have in wargaming, which don't have inserts. We don't even have boxes sometimes. So how do we store all of the miniatures, especially when they are painted? Because paint can still scrape away with depending on how the uh, miniatures are stored. So that's a whole thing to think out. And there are there is the full foam team, people that like having foam storage for their miniatures. There is the mag magnetic storage team, and there is the rest team, which generally either uses uh, inserts when they exist. Uh, for instance, many, if not most, uh, inserts in the box, and so these people keep using them, or look at for other storage, sometimes homemade, uh, sometimes uh, there are boxes like the crystal fortress uh, storage and every single of these storages have a drawbacks and is a pros and okay. cons pros and cons yeah uh, i am personally not very much of a me of a magnetic storage for instance because i have troubles locking my magnets into place under my the bases of my miniatures because oh, oh, <laughs> I have to tell you uh, that I am a pl of the magnetic storage, which is brutal. I I just put double-sided uh, uh, tape to the end of a shoebox, and then I just put the basis there. <gasps> yeah, heresy! <laughs> heresy! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have too many miniatures. How, how about we let Audrey talk a bit more about the right ways to do it before you spill all about the wrong way that you do it? <laughs> but wrong is fun. There, there is technically no right way to do it because it depends on which minis you have and which storage is available. Because it depends on which minis you have and which storage is available. Because, for instance, here I already talked about uh, Marvel Crisis Protocol, but it's a game where... There are various sizes of miniatures, and so it's very hard to, let's say, buy a foam case with um, all the same uh, inserts for miniatures, same uh, inserts for miniatures, and expect to fit everything. Because even in the biggest miniatures, uh, the Hulkbuster, uh, the Hulk, uh, Dormammu, they have different shapes, and they won't. There, there won't be an insert that fits all. So for this, I personally said, "Oh, I'm going to go for magnetic bay for my, my to go for magnetic bay for my, my I'm going to glue magnets under their bases. And what did I do to glue the magnets? I picked super glue. And if you pick very strong magnets, you take the miniature and you have the miniature, but the magnets are still inside the box. So when you decide to go the magnetic way to do it, you can't just magnetize anything. Some miniatures have slots uh, for the magnets under the bases, but sometimes you have miniatures with full uh, bases. Like if you buy, for instance, Micro Art Studio resin bases, they are full. There is not, uh, you don't have a slot uh, to put the magnet in, so that's something you have to take care of. I know that some people, which is a bit more stronger than the super glue, but uh, when you have uh, a base which is basically hollow on the bottom, you just sometimes can't uh, drone it with uh, epoxy and put the magnets there. So the magnetic uh, storage will generally widely depend on the basis of your miniatures. For everything that is the foam storage, generally uh, you have uh, quite a few companies like the there are mostly Feldherr in Europe, uh, and there is another one which I can't remember the name in USA, but because it's in USA, uh, who have, um, I think it's Battle Foam, inserts which are pre-cut with the miniature shapes. So that's what I use uh, for, the, for my Kingdom Death game. I have the, the Feldherr storage, which has slots for the biggest miniatures like the phoenix the sun stalker the dragon king and for the other miniatures which i could fit in like the pinups like the armor kits for the other miniatures which i could fit in like the pinups like the armor kits it's a standard storage with 
enough variety of shapes that I can fit the things in. So when you have a full game and you want to store all that full game together in one single box and say, oh, I'm going to pick that box and I go and I take the core box with me or in one single box and say, oh, I'm going to pick that box and I go and I take the core box with me. Yeah, that's, that's something that is very fine. Just sometimes some types of foams and some types of varnish do react uh, with time and it can be a bit of residue in the miniatures. One of the big culprits of that was the... Um, I, it happened to me, but that was a few years ago, and it was with the Games Workshop spray uh, varnish. Not the Minitorium, which is, which is a bit more recent than when that happened, but the previous one. And there is no reactivity there, and yeah, it can happen. But I'm very happy of these cases which I have for the Kingdom of Star because I, they moved from Italy to my parents, then to my parents to me, and then I moved apartments in the same city, and they moved and everything was well, uh, let's say, well kept and nothing broke. I personally enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I'm happy for this, but for the Marvel Crisis Protocol, I took it for the core box because it fits in the core box, there are every single slot uh, available, but for every expansion that I got, as the expansions are like two minis at a time, there is no fits it all case. Fits it all case. Then what I did is I went to um, a few other companies that are like uh, KR Multicase or Tabletop Tyrant in Europe that do it. It you can make your own case. And that's something that I really like because you can really take the... And that's something that I really like because you can really take the the um, tray. Try. So in, in some of these websites, you can decide which box you want, and then you can fill it virtually with the trays that you want. So you can pick and match different single box, let's say 10 different trays, which have maybe 20 different sizes of holes per cut. And that way, when you have games with very different uh, miniature sizes and volumes and shapes, you can end up being able to fill it and really be versatile with what you have and a versatile thing that, that you can get. And especially having the website uh, configured in a way that you can select the trays and you will see a box being filled and say, oh, you can still fit these inside, but these can't fit. Uh, I think that's something that's really great because that way you really have the control over what you're taking. I personally love that for games where you have different shapes and sizes. But then that might mean you have the box and you will have one tray that might stay not very filled for a long while. I don't personally think it's a problem. And that way, if I, or if I already have the box, get a new miniature, I can uh, pick it, I can assemble it, or semi-assemble depending on the mini, and then put it in the storage. And it takes no room in, on my shelves because the room, the space is taken by the storage box. It can seem stupid, but uh, personally, I like it. <laughs> and then I like it. <laughs> and then, yeah, there are other options, like I mentioned, for instance, storing the mini in the trays when games uh, come with trays, for instance, with the cool mini or not. Depending on how the trays are done, you might have uh, some issues because often the trays have some um, thinner points, have some... Um, thinner points or some spaces where it's folded on itself just to keep the miniatures in place and these might cause uh, some damage on the painting and I personally do not really enjoy this but if you are going for a very quick job and you use, if you are going for a very quick job and you use uh, paints that are very resistant as we know that some brands of paints are more resistant than other, depending on uh, the layer, the thickness of the varnish that is put on, you can get away with that. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Simon because that was one of the things I was going to... Their design of their vacuum form trays is always the assumption of, hey, you're going to keep all of our boxes. And then they don't really make most of the boxes the same size. And I'm like, I don't really want to keep all of your boxes because... I would rather condense your game down. Um, the one that really stuck with me was Rising Sun, the Laser Rocks insert, and I'm. Uh, it's worth a look at, listeners. Uh, I've shown some photos on our 
Discord for the, the guys to see. But uh, these are um, wooden frames designed to hold all of the pieces and they have acrylic tension-based locks so you through just natural friction and tension and the only wear and tear on the miniature paint jobs is around the base rim uh, and I really like that. Um, I, I bought the Rising Sun double set and condensed all the Rising Sun down to two boxes which made me really very happy. Yeah. Um, they, yeah they also, which made me really very happy. Yeah. Um, they, yeah. They also do some nice work on them. Um, so I, again, like I, I find laser rocks do some very good stuff. I've got a bunch of felled her inserts, uh, for, for my kingdom death stuff as well. Um, they're pretty great, but I wanted to shout out, um, two, eight, but I wanted to shout out, um, two other things which I've had for quite a while brands that have been really good. Uh, the first one, I don't know if you can get it anymore. Um, is the Crystal Cast Battle Hive. I bought one of these years ago for my Necromunda and it has just lasted and lasted it in my Necromunda and it has just lasted and lasted it and it's protected everything. None of the paint jobs have ever been ruined. Uh, it's all just stuck together nicely. It's just a classic like briefcase square thing that you flip open it's got a bunch of trays in it. Um, it's been really good. But the one I, I absolutely adore, um, it's been really good. But the one I, I absolutely adore uh, is from a company called KR Figure Cases. They're UK based, which is a shame because, of course, that means they're not in the EU anymore. But for any UK listeners, I would really recommend these if you've got like um, skirmish based games or if you've got like um, skirmish based games or army miniatures games or things like that. Uh, they do this line of. Uh, standardized blue foam trays they do pluck foam as well if you want to put varied things in and they mostly focus around uh, army miniatures army you know big piles of stuff and they do these great key lid in um, I got a load of these for my Blood Bowl and my Warhammer Quest miniatures and my Mordheim miniatures and they shipped over uh, like just perfect every single one came through they did really well. The boxes weren't even like dinged or dented up or anything. Perfectly safe. They're not the prettiest things, but heck, they're made of cardboard and I appreciate that at least the container is um, recyclable in the future, even if the foam trays possibly aren't. They also do like a line of hard cases and the same inserts go inside them. So they just stack up nicely. I write what's inside them on the front and... Uh, I know where all the miniatures are for those games that use crazy numbers of miniatures. So, yeah, I, I like the, that brand, but uh, they have, I, they, they have like a, an option for EU shipping, but I don't know if, which is why I would typically go with Feldher instead, because I know I'm not going to have to worry about customs there. So, yeah, that's, that's my part of it. Um, the biggest problem I have is I've got a big stack of them and I've got nothing to put them in, and they are... I mean, let's face it, miniature cases are kind of ugly. They're, like, aesthetically pleasing, really. So yeah. I'm trying to find some cupboards to hide them inside. Yeah, so show them in a cupboard. Yeah. 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 Exactly, exactly. Yeah, just that. <laughs> um, uh, I cannot really contribute to that, uh, to this discussion, except the, for my really contribute to that, uh, to this discussion, except the for my own artisanal ways and methods. One is taping the stuff to a shoebox. Of course, this doesn't work if you have any kind of precious basis. So if you uh, kind of base uh, even the sides of the base basis, so if you uh, kind of base uh, even the sides of the base, you cannot tape your miniature. That would be a crime. Uh, and. Uh, the, the other thing that works a lot artisanally is uh, actually CPU cases or electronics cases which are usually padded with the foam on both sides yeah. and uh, internally, yeah. So you can reuse them properly to store miniatures. For instance, Ooh. all, or, all or, my or blood... camera cases. That's a that's yeah. an old school one, that is. That's going back from before like miniature cases were a common thing. Yeah. 
So th that's basically it. Uh, that's my contribution to the miniature storage. And of course, uh, never store resins uh, in tight foam because that's just uh, retrieving them broken in a thousand pieces. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I still have got shipped over here. I expect quite a lot of breakages and I'm kind of in the posi position now that I don't really care if they're broken and I can't repair them. I'm just going <laughs> to toss them. I mean, yeah. 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 Just a last note for me on the Simon uh, storage. Um, they also have problems because sometimes each other that uh, sometimes parts uh, fold or get bent. Like I had this with the Rising Sun uh, spares from the Dragonfly clan. And uh, yeah, when parts of miniatures get uh, bent by the storage, that's when you uh, increase the risk of paint flaking or cautious of these uh, plastic uh, inserts. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them are good. Uh, I mean, like here I have uh, quite a few of the Marvel um, chibi from Simon and the inserts aren't as packed as minis as Rising Sun was so I think that these should be as minis as Rising Sun was so I think that these should be good enough to keep the miniatures in and not damage the paint but eh, still <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm going to do a quick, um, quick like thing of games I think that have done it really well or haven't done it so well that's on my shelf right now. Obviously, all done it so well that's on my shelf right now. Obviously, all of the Warhammer Quest games are terrible for it. There's just nothing. You need to get some kind of inserts. Um, Darklight Memento Mori is really good. Like I, I'm really happy with the vacuum inserts they provided. I'm um, always using them. Uh, Tales from the board game has a very good insert that even has spaces ready for the two expansions. So that was really cool. Uh, sword and sorcery, I'm not even going to paint that stuff because the only way I've managed to store everything is in a pile. So there's no point. Like, it's just in the box inside a tray. There's there's really no point. Get a game and I go, am I going to get round to painting these miniatures uh, or not? And if I think no, then I'm just going to pop them to one side and just let them sit in a bag and... That's mm -hmm. it. Seventh so. continent. I kept the uh, vacuum insert because the minis are so small. I don't care anywhere. I won't paint them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I missed that. Uh, I mean, felt not that much needed. So. Yeah, you, you didn't lose anything. It's just a bit more convenient, I would say, to grab a miniature on the map than a token. Sometimes uh, it's a bit more annoying to pick yeah. a token, but that's it. And since the minis are so small, it's hard to pick them from the base, so that's even less reason to paint them. Hard to pick them from the base, so that's even less reason to paint them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, um, the Townsfolk Tussle inserts really good. Yeah. Very, but, very good. Um, but that's game trays, so that yes, was that's game trays, of course. Uh, what else have we got here? It's game trays, of course. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, the Kingdom Death insert is terrible. Um, what is these... there an insert in the kingdom death box? There, there is an insert. <laughs> it basically holds the cards very badly and the tokens. Shh. Um, yeah, yeah. It wastes a bit of space. Yes. Shh. Um, yeah, yeah. It wastes a bit of space. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Nemesis is kind of okay if you don't paint the miniatures. No, it's fine if you paint the miniatures. I've got right here. Okay. This here. That's my Carnomorphs. I've painted. Uh, Carnomorphs. I've painted uh, half of the very smallest ones, whatever they're called. Um, I forget hatchlings or whatever breeders. Oh. No, crawlers. Crawlers. I okay. uh, paint half of those, and the inserts like great for that. Although maybe ten years down the line, the ten years down the line, the varnish might have fused them to the insert. I don't know, but uh, yeah. Personally, uh, as someone who painted them, although not to an amazing standard, I'm just getting them done. Uh, I, I I really actually quite like the inserts. Yeah, so Awaken Realms is okay, I guess. Yeah. And let's see if there's anything else on this shelf which has miniatures my experience, in it. My experience with Awaken Realms is, yeah, the miniatures are okay, but Spanish is not okay. <laughs> 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 it's the yeah. language and the storage the storage is is okay but please 
When, when you have syringe for miniatures, a loss already yeah. gone over that and plastic is a problem as well. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's tough. Uh, it's tough. Oh, yeah. The last ones I have is anything from fantasy flight games, as we know historically. Th- forget bad. about it. It's bad. It's bad. Uh, and Zaya Legends of a Drift System had a decent insert, but I ended up replacing it. But, but I ended up replacing it because I wanted something to hold the ships better than just a pool where they were all mixed up because they have flight stands and you know what flight stands are like with miniatures mm-hmm. they're really prone to breaking mm-hmm. so yeah that's uh, that's where i am with it all ultimately i make a judgment call if i'm going to paint or not and if i'm not going to paint then ultimately i make a judgment call if i'm going to paint or not and if i'm not going to paint then they can just be in a baggie mm-hmm. as long as they're soft enough that they don't get damaged yeah you don't want to put resin in the baggie no <laughs> No, re- resin, uh, resin needs a display case. That's it. Mm. That's it. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, we're going to go from one kind of plasticky thing that you hold and move around to a kind that you uh, hold and then roll. Um, it's time for Tom LeMann's latest offering. Unless uh, he was going to talk to us about Dice Realms. Yeah, let's talk about... So, uh, as Fen said, this is the new game from Tom Lehman and is published by Rio Grande Games. It's a dice building game, so like Dice Forge, to be clear, you physically change the faces of your dice when playing. Now, uh, uh, not before I start this game, but Rio Grande had some mechanical issues with dice and halted its distribution for a few months. So it ended up that European customers got early copies, but they had need to replace some components. US uh, customers couldn't get them in time. So this won't have any of the game because replacements were great. I have a copy with replacements. Uh, and it is the, it's the one on which I'm basing this review. And so it's not interesting to discuss this except for timestamps. So in this game, you rule a, a little kingdom presented by die faces. You start with a pretty basic kingdom made of two identical dice, one black and one white for reference. You play through several rounds that are are played every time almost simultaneously, where the loop is always the same, it's it's always the same, it's four phases, in which at first everyone rolls dice, plus one a single special red die called the fate die, which causes one effect which is applied to everyone that turn. Second, you collect res- resources from one that turn. Second, you collect res- resources from die faces and buy new stuff with coins, which are a kind of resource you get. This includes uh, buying new dice, upgrades for the dice, rerolls, and set a face tokens. We will talk about them later. It's for the dice, rerolls, and set a face tokens. We will talk about them later. Third, the core phase of the game, you upgrade dice. Four, you check if end game is met. Whenever during the game one pool of resources is depleted, game ends and you count victory another round. The player who at the end of the game scored the most victory points wins. So this is simple enough, but uh, the game has an incredible depth in each phase. Everything revolves about upgrades. You, uh, in this game, upgrades are both uh, upgrading your dice, but uh, they are also a resource. Basically, uh, you roll upgrades or buy upgrades as a resource and then spend them to upgrade die faces. When you do that, you can either upgrade or side grade the face, the same tech tree, you are upgrading, you are going up. When you swap a face with a face at the same power level but in another deck tree, you are side grading, okay? You can combine them both. You have a cost uh, depending on the uh, depth of the upgrade occurrence, but uh, it could happen that you need to be at a lower level to do the side grade you want. So it's, it's a thing that eventually happens. 
Uh, this is the core mechanic of the game because upgrades are, are worth victory points and by upgrading you can do all the, all the cool stuff in the game. You have part of the game, you, you randomize setup by drawing five tiles which provide five additional upgrades or, or tech trees, entire tech trees, uh, which have very specific powers, reroll powers, and uh, the extra weird stuff like uh, player attackers, reroll powers, and uh, the extra weird stuff like uh, player attacks. In this game, there is a bit of player interaction in the form of attacks mainly, uh, where you can attack uh, a face of another die on all opponents. You can attack an entire die which is out of the another die on all opponents. You can attack an entire die which is out of the round uh, out for out of the game for that round. Or you can attack resources by uh, depleting the pool of your opponent resources. Uh, now these five random tiles you draw mean all mean all because they make the game uh, replayable in all possible ways they make strategies viable or less viable in a single game and add gameplay options including the attack other than this the red fate die of the game with special faces with other powers uh, i won't talk a lot about this because these are interesting but i i didn't have the chance of trying all of them together i I still not played with the custom red fate die faces, so won't talk about that. One, co one consideration I have to do is uh, that I am always amazed at how good the balance uh, is for the starting version of Tom Lemon games. It, it is true that they eventually will need uh, rebalancing, but all Tom Lemon games all having all having common that balancing, but all Tom Lehman games all having all having common that it always takes at least me a long time to find exploitable patterns and expansions always rebalance things again so you have to start again this game is no exception to this uh start again this game is no exception to this uh needless to say i i find this game amazing stupid fun and addictive the first time I played, uh, I played with my group last last week four game four games straight. Then we paused a bit to play a quick turn at Tuffle Tussle. Then played another three games, and uh, well, uh, I, I think I, I uh, by by collecting all opinions, I, I think I can give you what's great and what's less great about this. What's great about Dice Realms is that you roll dice. <laughs> uh, chucking dice uh, is one of the pleasures of board gaming life and uh, you have plenty of that we call that the brouette <laughs> yeah that, that that's that's super cool and this game is balanced and uh, I, I say that uh, i say this with uh, with uh, every with having a dice game is one of the hardest design challenges and this game has a dozen little touches which do exactly that. Uh, for, for instance, the fact that uh, the upgrades are worth point by themselves mean that uh, at the end of the game, if you choose the, the right points, even if you never rolled that exact combo you wanted, and this game is full of small adjustments like that. For instance, in one of the three player games we played, uh, I rolled extremely good. I was super lucky. My friend, uh, wo one of my friends, uh, was the basically the non-upgraded face on every die, and uh, the other player played uh, mm, regularly. Let's say normal. Uh, at the end of the game, we scored 58, 57, and 56 points respectively. So the game was super tight, even. 57 and 56 points respectively so the game was super tight even if one of the players was incredibly uh, unlucky so uh, this game is addictive it, it gives you it gives you that vibe of uh, just one more play and that's good because it gives you that vibe of uh, just one more play and that's good because the games lasts uh, 45 minutes let's say 
and if it leaves you wanting to master it it's cool because you, you love the mechanics it's fun to play and you want to play one more one more it's replayable i played now 40 14 games 14 games total and uh, i have yet to see all tiles and i still haven't played with the red knife faces and this game was new every time and that for me i also had a, a little list of the bad which is uh, well you are rolling dice <laughs> and dice are frustrating some play some players uh, will just hate chucking dice so like, like a, a, as much as this is a good, uh, this is also a bad of the, uh, there are player attacks which can be brutal. So uh, they can frustrate some players. That happens if you played with uh, people who uh, bogged the game down in games like Res Arcana. This is Res Arcana squared. It's a lot annoying to have keeping rolling attacks against everyone and it can slow the game down. If you are competitive you can appreciate this if you aren't you are hating this feature uh, what about a cat it's... attacking uh, the dice yeah cat, cat attack is the final move of, of every dice game so yes <laughs> anyway uh, the, the thing with attacks is that you can skip them completely because uh, you are you are given the option to remove all attack dice which are recognizable recognizable because they are red so it's kind of okay attacks <laughs> the third uh, downside of this game is the price this game has a manufacturer suggested retail price of 115 dollars that's Re rio grande games pricing and it's all plastic I mm. have to say components, but there's no point in denying this is a lot expensive. I if... was yeah, I was going to say it is expensive, and I'm not surprised given that this is a bunch of Lego dice, basically. Like, yeah, there's a yeah, lot yeah. of plastic. Yeah, a lot of engineering went in that. Uh, they uh, were quick to fix the mechanical. This is a, uh, 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 this proves that they are actually working a lot of the, of this on these dice but uh, they are expensive if you think that dice forge costs 40 dollars that there's a price difference now i i i, I would like to pair it to them before questions because uh, uh, i would like to compare this game to three games i think they are uh, an example of how this game stands uh, in my rankings roll for the galaxy is the first Roll for the Galaxy is Woo! a great, great game which uh, uh, complete perfectly transposes the 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 original feeling of Race for the Galaxy on a dice game. However, Roll for the Galaxy has no player interaction. You have to play dice behind uh, behind the screen. It's a bit of clunk. It it makes not feel the game completely interactive. It's like you are playing solo against other people. And, and the that's action peaking, why I yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this game I is I play Race for the Galaxy without takeovers. Yeah. So, so I think of interaction. More interaction in these realms. And uh, the, 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 let's say the, the, the trust issues of rolling behind the screen, they're, they are not there because you play simultaneously, you, everything is always in the face of other people. Of course, you won't be always checking other people, but if you are playing, I suppose it's for fun and not because, and not because everyone wants to win and cheat their way to winning. So uh, that's kind of a lesser problem. But that's okay. Roll for the Galaxy is an exceptional game. I find this more interactive. So t I tend to like it and recommend it over Roll for the Galaxy. That I tend to like it and recommend it over Roll for the Galaxy. Dice Forge. Uh, Dice Forge is the obvious competitor because it's a very good dice building game. Now, Dice Realm... Dice Realms sharply focuses on the economy engine. It's basically Dice Realm. Dice Realms sharply focuses on the economy engine. It's basically that with a, with a few twists. 
it goes deeper than Dice Forge there, and uh, you have to consider that Dice Forge is. Uh, it's true that it's uh, eight die, it's forty dollars, but it's eight hundred eight faces. While for comparison, Dice Realms is eighteen dice and more than six hundred and fifty faces. Okay, you won't play with all together in every single game because you randomize, but it's more than six hundred and fifty faces. I'd say that if you just want to try dice building as a mechanic. Uh, you should be better off with Dice Forge, but uh, Dice Realms is a good game. It's a full game, it's a great game with an economy engine and a, a reason to have Dice Building there and it works. Reser game I want to compare this with because I am kind of proficient in Res Arcana and to be honest, this is the most comparable game of the three out here. Because if you look at it from a certain angle, Dice Realms, it's like playing the dice-based counterpart of Res Arcana. Res Arcana, because it has a draft, and the way you end, because Res Arcana is a, is a pure race to 10 victory points or 13 if you are playing with expansions. And uh, Dice Realms, uh, you can control the tempo by just uh, trying to exhaust or preserve some resources. So this change, Res Arcana, I love my Dice Forge, so my, 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 my suggestion would be to get them both. However, if you just are minding your expenses, if you want the early control that Draft gives you, or you just playing eight dice, get Res Arcana instead, because Dice Realms, you, or you just playing eight dice, get Res Arcana instead, because Dice Realms uh, is a dice game, is an expensive dice game. Oddly enough, though, I have to say, if you, uh, if you just want game balance, and this is weird to say, I think that Dice Re if you just want game balance, and this is weird to say, I think that Dice Realms is more balanced than Res Arcana. Core against core. And that's it. Dice Realms in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna switch me off playing Roll for the Galaxy. The that game, <laughs> that game with the expansions is so very good, and I don't think I could justify the price of <laughs> of that. Yeah, I, I actually don't want to switch you off from playing Roll for the Galaxy because that that is a good game. I think this is so. It could be they are different because the mechanic they focus on is different. The, the, the action selection kind of bidding or Roll for the Galaxy is unique, is unique to Roll for the Galaxy and Race for the Galaxy. They are smart, they are cool. Uh, we, back then, when we had just Sales for the Galaxy as the big games, I always loved the Race for the Galaxy. So these are historical games, great games. I'm, I'm just going to cheekily point out that the action selection system is in Puerto Rico, San Juan and New Frontiers. Yeah, but you don't bid for the actions like you do. Uh, yeah, but you don't bid for the actions like you do. Uh, roll for I'm the just Galaxy saying in cool. comparison to roll and race. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I'm just the taking a cheap shot. You don't yeah, have to defend. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. I, I understand, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just here, having a bit of fun. Here, um, I'm, yeah. here I'm going to stick with Dice Forge, which has... Just having a bit of fun. Here, um, I'm, yeah. here I'm going to stick with Dice Forge, which has the added benefit of being uh, so well stored inside the box that I can put it on the side uh, vertically and use it uh, to block access uh, to my uh, internet uh, router, to my cat. Double oh. uses. Okay, about that storage of uh, uh, Dice Realms is quite good. You have three trays and space for a fourth, which Tom Lehman said will come as an expansion. Uh, and the trays can be put vertically and they will stay in place. And that's a, uh, I mixed a face uh, among the trays and it was a nightmare. We spent like 10 minutes searching for it because they are a counted resource, so that it's important that they are correctly numbered. Well, that's great, because I'm going to now move on to talking about this uh, podcast, and this one comes in a very small box, uh, and has like quite a lot stuffed inside it. 
This is Mantis Falls in uh, brackets, a game of trust, uh, subtitled Like Life, a cooperative game that's only really cooperative. This is a first release from Distant Rabbit Games. They're an American company. They have said they're going to specialise in semi-cooperative social deduction games. Um, this was like Kickstarter, I think it was 2020. I got this uh, in summer of 2021, Kickstarter edition. Um, interestingly, before I get into them, is Adrian Kerahard, who is a Associate Professor of Nutrition and Food Studies in Montclair State University, and Julie Beerworth, who is a food scientist and acrobat and acrobatic instructor. <laughs> That's uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so both of them have come out of nowhere, no back, come out of nowhere, no background in board games, and gone. We're going to found a little company. We're going to specialize in these games, and this is their first release. And I wanted to highlight who they were because th they've done really well with this first game. Um, so Mantis Falls. The concept is this. It's the night. Mantis Falls. The concept is this. It's the nineteen forties ish, and you're in the mob ruled town of Mantis Falls. You've seen something you weren't supposed to see that could perhaps undo the mob and you need to get out of town. So you've got a contact and that person said, hey, go here to this diner. You're going to meet with this diner. You're going to meet with someone else who's also seen something. And the pair of you, you need to get out of town to this place together um, and we'll pick you up. So it's I wouldn't go to that dinner. I wouldn't go personally. Well, here's the great thing that they're on the level, right? They, you go there and there may well be the roll cards. Two of them are innocent witnesses. One of them is an assassin. And they get shuffled up and two of them are dealt out to the players and the last one's removed from the game without looking at it. So you could be playing the game legitimately fully co-op with another player who is entirely on the level and looking to escape. And if both of you escape, you win. A 50% chance they could be an assassin if you're a witness. And then they might be looking to try and bump you off before they get to the end. And they need to survive as well to get a victory there. So, you know, they've got to kill you without dying themselves. And that in itself is just really interesting as a, a mechanic because there's not many tuned of a little bit. And in human conditions, which is based on the Blade Runner test that I can't remember the name of. Romeo and um, Juliet! So yeah, so that's two. And they're um, pretty interesting. But this is like such a strange unusual and really complete game so i'm going to give you a kind of quick over there it doesn't paint the mob in a good light either um in my opinion which is great because normally mob games glorify the gangsters so you're yeah. you deal out a row of like a winding path of cards on a really nice kind of i don't know what the material is it's very soft the lower maybe but it's a very and Basically, this road lays out of 12 spaces. The final one's the escape, and the start one is the start of the road. And you will have a roll dealt to you, which tells you how many hit points you have and gives you some kind of special ability. Uh, as an example, the doctor has a maximum of seven wounds. Uh, as an example, the doctor has a maximum of seven wounds. Um, and when they play their last gasp action, which I'll explain briefly later on, they can play an additional wound item to heal themselves. Now, <clears throat> as you... Uh, a, a, so the flow of the game is pretty straight. As you... Uh, a, a, so the flow of the game is pretty straightforward. You uh, move yourself a, a road section forward uh, if you want to. You might not want to. Um, sometimes it pays to stop. Uh, then you can expend conserved energy, which is a mechanic where you, you can expend conserved energy, which is a mechanic where you can put cards up at the top in a line for anyone to use. Um, then you will draw an event. And this is the bit that's really cool, because if you draw an event, it'll either be a white faced card or a black faced card. White faced cards are a faced card or a black faced card. White faced cards are um, a scene incident. This means both players see the card, you put it face up, and it's like resolving in any co-op game an event where you need to try and deal with whatever happens or whatever goes on. Very simple. But the other ones are unseen event, and they're black. And when you get one, you say all you say is, oh, we've drawn an unseen event. And you, you tell the other player, 
kind of almost anything really. You can tell them the truth, what the card does, or you can lie about it. For example, I got one here and I could say, oh hi, so we've drawn this, um, the enemy that with them, and if we don't, then the player who's furthest back, which is you, uh, is going to take all of the wounds equal to the yellow number I'm on, which is three. So you'd have to take three wounds. Um, but if we beat them, we can move forward equal to my green number. Sounds pretty straightforward. Well, in actual truth, it's any number, this, the end all, and I choose who actually takes the wounds. So while I have to operate this card fully, I've basically said, I've done all my decisions in advance and told you, hey, this card is going to operate exactly this way and you're going to get screwed over if we fail it. <laughs> That's you can even, diabolical. Yeah, and then it gets discarded face down so you don't... <laughs> That's you can even, diabolical. Yeah, and then it gets discarded face down so you don't get to see what's going on. You can even have, like, um, here we are, uh, just, just nothing happens on an unseen event at all. Uh, but you can convince the other player to put some cards in to try and deal wounds to a fictional opposition. The way that a fictional opposition, the way that you play, you try and resolve it is you'll play a number of action cards and you have to match suits and these cards will do various different things and you build a little left to right programming loop that you walk through and you'll do like the active person will do one then the, the other player will and so on until they've operated all of their things. And they very can be very simple. They can just be like a baseball bat, which deals one wound to the event opposition. Great. If you're being attacked, smack them with a baseball bat. Or uh, the one which always makes me wince a bit is called the tools. Uh, and it's a set of pliers which deals one wound to the event. There's a load of other things you can do uh, on other actions. They're very simple. And uh, you, you just like operate the whole queue out. And this is that kind of programming in a board game that I like. It's not too much. Like, Robo Rally is overwhelming for me, but I can work through these, and that's, like, pretty good. A few other bits and pieces, you can get allies who, once you've collected enough cards of that particular ally, they'll give you a bonus. Um, and then there's sometimes, like, set things that happen on the road, like there's going to be phone booths or ambushes. Uh, the really neat thing about phone booths is everyone's dealt one card at the start. The really neat thing about phone booths is everyone's dealt one card at the start of the game, which basically says, play this, deal six wounds to the other player. Or, if you're truly a witness, you can play it and deal nine wounds to the other player, which basically puts them straight on death's door immediately. So, you've both gone straight on death's door immediately. So... You've both got a, a like a loaded gun in your hand that if you're anywhere near a phone booth, you can go, hey, I need help, shoot the other person, and a sniper's called in, boom. And that player gets really done in and is at the point, well, if you're innocent, the point of death. But if you're an assassin, you make this move and tip your hand. <laughs> and that pushes me to last gasps, which is basically up to three times. If you're dead, you're on zero wounds, or you're, so you're on your maximum wounds, say seven for the doctor, you can play one card from your hand, and if it's medicine and it heals you, then you're back in the game, but you increase your last gasps to kill you. So this game is just, oh. It's like, it's like Points of Destiny. It is. It is. It's so uh, tight now and exciting. Um, it comes with a bunch of additional expansions already in the box. There's a uh, full circle one that like expands all the various this triad that adds this turns it into a three player game um, so I will say on the downside um, first of all the game's really hard I've actually to learn this the first two times we first few times we played it we played it pure co-op and still failed at times like the the, the mob the assassin to win when you're um ready. Like when sorry when you're not experienced with the game, uh, so that's like a bit of a problem. And I don't think it works great as a three-player game because of the mechanics. There's one person is always um, a bystander. They're not involved. Be in a situation where you're suddenly like, I know who the assassin is, and I want to take do something, and you can't. Or, or the assassin is like making a move to kill the other witness, and you're like, oh no. I, I, I can't do anything to help here. If you can't survive, we lose. So if you're not okay with being lose, so if you're not okay with being completely passive on one of every like three turns or so, then 
that can be a problem. But two player, I I haven't the only two player seduction uh, seduction two player social deduction game I've played that I've enjoyed as much is in human conditions. A that I've enjoyed as much is in human conditions, and I think this is great. Just such a great thing from uh, two people who come out of nowhere. First thing, first game, and it's really well realised. It's dripping with theme. Um, the artwork is quite sparse, and um, the artwork is quite sparse and noir. Um, and they've done so many neat little things, like the inside of the box has a map of Mantis Falls on it. It's a really nice, like, well drawn map. Gorgeous. Um, every card is is illustrated, uh, but they have a very sparse. It's illustrated, uh, but they have a very sparse, noir, almost Sin City-like look to them. I think Julie did the uh, work for this. Um, some people might feel it's a bit uh, print-and-play clip-arty, but I find that really adds to the atmosphere and, and allows you to fill in the blanks on what adds to the atmosphere and, and allows you to fill in the blanks on what the world is like and what's going on. So, hard to get. But yeah, go on. No, no, I, uh, the illustration feel like the the old newspaper advertisements for like X-ray glasses or stuff. Yes. That, yeah. Yeah. It's it, indeed. Um, if you are interested in this game, I don't know when it's going to be in full retail or if it is already. I couldn't find that information out. Uh, but you can watch a nice summary from Julie on YouTube, and she goes through the entire game mechanics in quite an atmospheric way. That's why I haven't gone into full details on how to play because they covered it great. Uh, I'll say the other things that are fantastic, they noticed the cards were getting wear, wore, a lot of wear and tear when playing because of like you're handling them and moving them around a great deal. So they, they gave sleeves in the box. Um, I have wooden, have wooden tokens for all of the characters and wooden boards as well for um, tracking wounds and last gasps. And they even gave a bunch of do-it-your-own cards. If you wanted to make your own little bit of custom content, there's like oh, but, but, 12 That's always so fun, cards. that's always fun. Oh. It is, it is. But, but, that's always so fun, cards. that's always fun. Oh. It is, it is. Um, so honestly, I've not ever seen a card game like this, or even a two-player two traitor deduction style game like this. And I will say that it is it's oh when when you it is it's oh when when you do get betrayed it is so like such a sweet moment you have to have to like appreciate it and and the way that the game encourages you to lie creatively about these cards but you you have to make sure that the end result of the card is played a, a great deal it's it's just there's nothing like it at all is there a way that uh, both the assassin and the witness die at the end? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can actually, as your last gasp, knock off the assassin if they've been unkilled by your last go, and then they die as well, and you both lose. Okay. They don't win unless they survive, so yeah. And the game batters the heck out of you anyway, so sometimes you can just die along the way, and if the other player thinks you're the assassin, and it's like, I'm not going to help you, um, then tough luck. They get to the end, and you're like, yeah, well, I needed to survive as well, and you wouldn't trust me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really happy I got this game. Um, even though right now I'm having a terrible time trying to pack it all away again. It's so, so stuffed full, this box. Is that it? Is that it? Yeah, there we go. There we are. Does it fit? It fits. So yes, that's Mantis Falls. If you do see it and it sounds like something you're interested in, uh, I definitely recommend it. And more importantly, next time Distant Rabbit Games are doing something on Kickstarter, which maybe will be this year, I don't know. It's been two years since they check it out because this was an impressive piece from a pair of first-time designers. I'm checking this rabbit games. It looks like uh, it's uh, always in stock in uh, US, like at Barnes and Noble. And uh, you have a few options at Brett Spiel Price Noble. And uh, you have a few options at Brett Spiel Price uh, 
if you go there in Europe too. That's one in Italy. <laughs> yeah, excellent. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can order it from their website as well if you're in the States. And if you can get it in Europe, fantastic. But uh, order it from their website as well if you're in the States. And if you can get it in Europe, fantastic. But, uh, yeah, if, if you like what I've talked about here and it's your kind of genre, because I love social deduction games. That's why I love Nemesis. It's the only game where you actually do betray people, you know, as opposed to being told you're evil from the start. Instead, you make that decision. Social deduction games. And this one is... Uh, very nice, a very nice little like package for what well, they got here thirty thirty four ninety nine dollars MSRP. So, well, I think that is all we have time for at this point. So, hopefully, you've also made it out of Mantis Falls alive. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standy or follow us as the last standy on Twitter or subscribe on your preferred podcast app, or perhaps even find us somewhere lurking, hiding on Board Game Geek. I'm mostly in the single-player guild. Uh, so it's farewell from Alessio. It's out! Pardon? No, I, 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 I was trying <laughs> to do that. So I, to... <laughs> I did. <laughs> I, I took me a moment to process what you said. That was actually really funny, and I ruined it by being deaf. Uh, so, no... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and myself standy is for well let's just say escape and if we said it before tough luck <laughs> <laughs> that was that was easy <laughs> yeah